So a very warm welcome to everybody who is joining us at home to worship. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, The first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbour as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. Lord, have mercy. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commands, and to live in love and peace with all. And we join together in the confession at the top of page three. Almighty God, our heavenly Father, We have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we join together in the Gloria on page five. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, You take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. O God, you know us to be set in the midst of so many and great dangers that by reason of the frailty of our nature we cannot always stand upright. Grant to us such strength and protection as may support us in all dangers and carry us through all temptations through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now we're going to have our reading from the Bible, and Philippa is going to read for us this morning. The reading. 
reading this morning is from Colossians chapter 1, starting at verse 21 on page 1182. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behaviour, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his, in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. So as we come to look together at God's word, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and we pray that you be at work in us and among us by your Holy Spirit. Give us understanding in our minds and help us to respond to you in our hearts. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning we are continuing to look at Paul's letter to the Colossians um, and we're looking at chapter 1 verses 21 to 23 and you can find this in the Blue Pew Bibles on page 1182 and you may find it helpful to follow the verses with me as we look at them. And if you don't have a Blue Pew Bible to hand there are some in different places around in the church. So Colossians 1 verses 21 to 23. I don't know if you have yet got round to tidying or spring cleaning your house. It's a little early for spring cleaning, only in the midst of February. Uh, But if you do have in mind to clear out a cupboard or some storage area within your house then you'll know that among all the junk and behind perhaps all those different items that you don't need or don't want there may well be just one thing that is too precious or too valuable to be thrown away something that you really want to keep hold of because it means a lot to you Well, Paul writes to the Colossian Christians from prison to encourage them that their Christian faith is one of those things that is far too precious to be thrown away. Something that they and we should hold on to and value and keep, even in all the trials and troubles and difficulties of life. And here in these verses, verses 21 to 23, Paul tells us why. Why the gospel is so precious and valuable to us. Why we should persevere with it and not let it go. So in verse 21, we'll see the great need that we have that God has met for us. In verse 22, we'll see the great blessings that he pours out upon us. And taking those verses together, we'll see how the gospel is good news that we really need. And then finally, in verse 23, we'll see the response that God longs for us to make to all his goodness. So our need and God's blessings and our response. Hopefully that will help us to follow through these verses as we look at them together. So let's begin with verse 21 and the need that we have that God meets for us. Paul writes this. Once 
you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behaviour. I don't know if those words are a surprise to you. They may have been uh, to some who heard them. Certainly today, most people, if you speak to them about how they feel about God, would assume that their relationship with God is just fine. That they're okay with him. Even if they ignore his laws or take no account of God whatsoever if he has no room in their lives. That's a common assumption. God takes a kind of place of Father Christmas in our sort of social consciousness. But the reality, the truth that the Bible sets before us is quite different and perhaps a little uncomfortable. It tells us that until we trust in the Lord Jesus, right up to that point, our relationship with God is broken. That we are estranged from him. And that we desperately need that relationship to be healed. That is a great need that we see in verse 21. And it's a need that's true of everyone outside of Christ before we trust in him. It's true of us before we believe, true of our friends and neighbours, our colleagues and family members. It's a verse that reminds, them, reminds us of their great need of grace, how they need to hear the gospel. But it also reminds us of God's great love for us. Because God has been in the business of loving his enemies long before he asked us to do that. He set us the example of that by loving us when we were far off and lost and estranged from him. Well, that's our great need. And if we wonder, well, how does God meet it? And what has he done to resolve it? Well, then we see the answer in verse 22. Paul puts it like this. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight. There are three wonderful truths that we can see in that verse. The first is what God has done. He has reconciled us. Reconciliation is, of course, what we long for when a friendship breaks down. When we fall out with somebody, we're not always sure why. Or sometimes we know exactly why. And we long for that, that friendship to be made whole. And that is what God has done for us. He has reconciled himself to us. Enemies become friends. Relationships that were broken are healed. We are put right with God and can know his friendship and favour, his blessings and his presence. But how has he done that? Here's a second truth we see in verse 22. He's reconciled us by Christ's physical body through death. And this is a clear, unmistakable reference to the cross, isn't it? The cross on, at which, or on which, Jesus bore our sin and shame. Where he took the punishment we deserve instead of us. So that we can be forgiven and put right with God and receive his promise of new life. Later on, we'll be celebrating communion this morning. And what we remember as we take the bread and wine is Jesus' death on the cross for us. 
One of the reasons why communion means so much to so many of us is because the cross means so much. Because Jesus' death in our place is so precious to us. Because it's the only way that we can be put right with God. So we are reconciled to God. We're reconciled through Jesus' death in our place on the cross. And then thirdly, to what end does God do all this? What does he have in mind? What is he aiming at? Well, we see this in verse 22 as well. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. And perhaps a key phrase there is in his sight. You see, once we trust in Jesus, and once we're put right with God through faith, when he looks at us, despite our many and unmistakable, unavoidable failings and frailties, God sees the perfect righteousness of his Son. He looks at us and he doesn't see our sin. He sees Jesus' holiness. And that's the only way that we can be without blemish and free from accusation in his sight. It's not that he forgives us and then gives us a a task to do. Go and live a perfect life and then you'll be okay. We could never do that. We trip up and fall down every day. But this is what the Bible calls imputed righteousness. That the righteousness of Jesus is credited to us. Credited to our account. God looks at us and sees us as blameless in his sight. So there's our need. We were estranged from God. There's the blessings we receive as we trust in Jesus. We're forgiven. We're put right with him. We're righteous in his sight. And that just leaves us with one final question. How do we respond to the wonderful, loving, gracious kindness of God that he has shown us in the gospel. And verse 23 tells us that we can respond by holding on, by persevering, by not letting go, by not throwing away our faith that is so precious to us. In fact, these blessings, the blessings of being forgiven and right with God are in a way, conditional on us doing so. Let's look at verse 22 and 23 together. Paul writes that we've been reconciled by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation if you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved, from the hope held out in the gospel. Real, genuine, authentic faith stays the course. It holds on. It perseveres. It endures. It may go through terrible times of hardship. It may face discouragement and despondency. It may battle against ill health, rejection, persecution. Or the unsettling of our mood. There may be times when neighbours and friends don't want to know us. When others laugh or scorn because of our trust in Jesus. When there are moments when our hope seems thin and we are just holding on barely. But real faith does endure. It doesn't let go. It perseveres, even through the hardest of times. Those who genuinely trust in Christ are not moved from the hope held out 
in the gospel. And when Paul uses that phrase gospel, that word means good news. He really means the genuine, authentic Christian message that he proclaims. It's the only authentic sort of Christianity there is. It's the one that had been proclaimed throughout the known world, known to Paul. The only message that he announces. This is the gospel that you heard, relayed by Epaphras, that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, have become a servant. So how do we respond then to the wonderful, gracious goodness of the God who loves us? Or we can perhaps recognise the need we had, that we were far from God, and the wonderful rescue mission he has brought about through the cross, reconciling us to himself when we couldn't do that for ourselves. But perhaps more than anything, we respond, as Paul hoped the Colossian Christians would respond, by holding on, holding firm, not letting go of the faith that we have received, not being distracted by the world, not discouraged by life's hardships, not deceived by those who bring a different message, but trusting in Christ, Rejoicing in the forgiveness we've received and looking forward to that place in heaven that we're promised as those who trust in him. Let's pray that we will. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness, your grace and mercy towards us. We thank you that once we were far from you, but now we are reconciled. We ask you to help us not to stray from our faith, not to give up upon it, but to hold on to you, trusting that you will hold on to us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well now let's respond to God's word by joining together in the words of the creed and you'll find them on page 7 in the service books. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, Eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Well, in a moment we're going to pray, but before we do so, we're going to sing from our songs and hymns of fellowship, number 469, Rock of Ages, Cleft 
famille. sit or kneel to pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for rescuing and saving us when we were far off and lost without you for turning your enemies into friends and giving us new life and new hope. Thank you for declaring us to be righteous in your sight through the forgiveness of our sins and by Jesus' death in our place. Help us to live up to the new identity you give us. And to live lives of love which reflect your love for us. Help us to endure and persevere and to hold on to the apostolic faith which we have heard and received and which saves us if we continue in it. Keep us and watch over us and protect us so that we won't be deceived or distracted by this world but will find all our joy and peace in you. We pray for all those who are unwell or bereaved despairing or discouraged. That 
you would draw near to them and give them peace and hope and joy and a saving faith in Jesus. We pray for all those relationships which are in need of restoration and healing. We thank you for your reconciling power, which we see at work through the cross. And we ask that as we have been put right with you, through faith in Jesus, so we would also see your grace and mercy, changing hearts and restoring relationships. And we ask all these things in the precious name of Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. Amen. And now turning to page 38, we join in our communion prayer. Prayage. The Lord is here. His spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ you shared our life, that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. On the night he was betrayed at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take it. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. As we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, send your Holy Spirit that this bread and this wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us one in Christ, our risen Lord. With your whole church throughout the world, we offer you this sacrifice of bread and lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. And turning to back to page 12, as our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So in a moment we'll be offering communion and as usual if you'd like to receive 
either the bread or wine or both, and do come up the centre aisle. Um, you can receive the bread if you want the wine as well, just indicate that to me. Uh, you don't have to have the wine, you can just have the bread, or of course you don't have to have either. And then we'll just go down the side aisles back to our pews. And as we're coming up to receive communion, we'll be able to hear um, some beautiful music on the harp. So do come forward to receive communion if you would like to.
Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Well, as we think of all that God has done for us, rescuing us, reconciling us, forgiving us and offering us new life in Christ, we're going to sing our final song together. It's number 10 in Songs and Hymns of Fellowship, Amazing Grace. of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, rest on each one of you, now and always. Amen.